the 120-foot high tower faced in black granite of the Odeon Leicester Square, the flagship theatre of the Odeon Circuit in London's West End, seen here in 1984. The Odeon Circuit was born in the early 1930s, the brainchild of a Birmingham businessman named Oscar Deutsch, born in 1893. Familiar Odeon style of lettering first appeared on his cinema at Perry Bar, a suburb of Birmingham, which opened in 1930. in the Spanish Moorish style popular at the time and had superficial touches of the atmospheric approach in the outdoor views painted on the side walls of the auditorium. But this Odeon was a one-off and did not become part of the Odeon circuit until well after the circuit started. William accountant and councillor W.G. Elcock partnered Oscar Deutsch in establishing local companies to build Odeons, as did Stanley Benny Bate, a former businessman in the oil world. Often, local partners were involved, as in the first Odeon to open as part of the new circuit, the Odeon at Weymouth. Local businessmen contributed the disused bus garage, which was converted into the Odeon at a cost of £1,800 open in June 1933. As at Perry Bar, there was a nod towards the atmospheric style. Paintings of the Wessex countryside on the side walls gave an outdoors impression. The colour photographs show the Odeon, comparatively little altered, as part of the classic chain in April 1974. Some local authorities insisted that gramophone records were stored and played in a room separate to the projection box. This is a long, narrow hall, originally with 541 seats, all on one floor, and it constituted a very modest debut for the Odeon circuit. Another humble early Odeon was this one at Lansing in Sussex. It had 691 seats on one floor and offered another superficial gesture towards the atmospheric style. Quickly an embarrassment to the circuit, it was independently operated as the Regal in late 1939. When the war started, Lansing, like many other south coast towns, became deserted and the Regal closed and the lease was returned to Odeon. It was then offered to Mrs. Merriman Langdon of the Ritz Seaford, who had had previous links with Oscar Deutsch at the Seaford Empire and Rothbury, Port Slade. Mrs. Langdon agreed to try and make a go of the cinema, but she too was defeated. Odeon resumed control in 1942, and in 1945 it reverted to its original name of Odeon. What makes this little Odeon unique is that it is the only theatre built and opened as Odeon, leased off as the Regal, taken back and renamed Odeon. The Odeon at Kingston on Thames, on a narrow site backing onto the river, was the second Odeon to open in 1933, a month after Weymouth. It was a properly designed theatre, seating 1,516, even if the balcony was rather high and a long climb to reach. The architects were James E. Adamson and Marshall and Tweedy. These 1984 views show it little altered in its present role as a top-ranked bingo club. Also in 1933 came an Odeon at Canterbury, which for a while could not be called Odeon. He had that name, and so it was called the Friar, after the street in which it was located. It was designed by local architects Alfred and Vincent Burr in a rather heavy-handed manner. 
The pillars and the shelves on the side walls indicate the work of an elderly architect working in a supposedly modern auditorium, and the two just do not mix. The colour views from 1974 and 1981 when it closed show how little the auditorium had altered over the years. It has since been adapted for use as a live theatre called the Marlow. First of 17 odeons to open in 1934 was this smallish odeon at Worcester Park, Surrey designed by Yates, Cook and Derbyshire. It was an early casualty of declining attendances and closed in 1956 to be eventually converted into a supermarket. Oscar Deutsch was the subject of much ridicule for opening another Odeon, also designed by Yates, Cook and Derbyshire. It was built amidst open space at Tolworth in Surrey in anticipation of housing developments that would bring in sufficient numbers of people to make it pay. It was, in any case, edged out by other bigger cinemas in the area and closed in 1959 to be demolished for an office block. A jibe of the time said, I was out in the country the other day, and what do you think I saw? An Odeon. At Kemptown, Brighton, an Odeon was created out of an existing structure with the addition of a new front. This undistinguished building, seating 958 people, was the first work for Odeon by the architect Andrew Mather. It closed in 1960 and is seen in the colour shots in 1981 as a bingo hall. Wallington Odeon in suburban Surrey was another smallish early Odeon designed by Yates, Cook and Derbyshire with 925 seats on one floor. It was an early victim of declining attendances, closing in 1957. Development of this distinctive circuit style for the exteriors of Odeon came in a series of buildings designed for the circuit by architect A.P. Starkey. These were mostly in suburban locations and in the Harrow area. They had low, wide frontages, usually incorporating shops and flats, and with a deep central recess. The fronts of these Odeons were clad in the yellowish tiles that were to be a quintessential part of the Odeon image. They had horizontal bands in green and red to relieve any sense of monotony while neon tubing was placed to outline the basic shapes of these Odeons by night. The interiors, seating around 1,000, were often built on the stadium principle, with a raised rear section to provide a balcony. At Wealdstone, there was the rare addition of a Compton organ, Generally, organs were considered an unnecessary expense at Odeons, except at seaside resorts, or to compete with organs at rival theatres, or at the insistence of a local partner. Perhaps the last reason explains the organ at this small Odeon.
the screen tabs or curtains at Odeon's were often decorated with striking abstract or fantastic designs. Most of these early Odeon's designed by A.P. Starkey to survive was the one at Collindale, operated in its final years by the classic circuit. The Odeon name has been removed from the space it originally occupied above the four vertical black piers in the centre. These colour shots date from July 1981 when it closed. This impressive Odeon at Worthing has a strong vertical emphasis by its tower with the Odeon sign and clock with the 12 letters of the words Odeon Theatre, replacing the numerals on the clock face. Here, the use of the yellow biscuit-coloured tiles was essentially restricted to the tower and the forward-jutting cafe area. It had an organ to entertain the visitors to this seaside town, while the cafe also catered to the holiday hordes. It is the first large Odeon in a prominent location in an important town, and it occupied an island site. Since 1973, the rear stalls area, under the balcony, has been turned into two sort of small cinemas, and the central lighting fixture in the ceiling no longer lights up, while on the outside, the clock has been removed from the tower. Designed by the practice of Winnie, Sun and Austin Hall, and seated 1,551 people. The colour shots of the Odeon date from 1973 and show how little it has changed since its opening in 1934, except for the removal of the organ 11 years before. Light coloured tiles were again much in evidence at the Surbiton Odeon seen here in 1973. It has since closed and been converted into a do-it-yourself store. It was the only Odeon designed by Joseph Hill. Originally, there were strips of concealed lighting in the recesses in the ceiling to match those on the sides. While the circular features on the side walls of the stalls also lit up, Behind the screen, the recess for the loudspeakers in the rear wall can be seen. At Haverstock Hill, Oscar Deutsch took over a cinema scheme designed by T.P. Bennett and Son. It was built and opened as an Odeon. This was a magnificent cinema and served as the leading Odeon in the London area until the opening of Leicester Square. The auditorium had a superbly designed fan-shaped layout with a series of parallel troughs of concealed lighting on the splay walls and ceiling that could be switched off in progression towards the screen to precede the parting of the curtains and the start of the program. The Odeon Barnet was also a cinema taken over during the course of construction and so it bears little relation to the circuit style. Designed by Edgar Simmons, 
It has changed little in these 1984 colour photographs, except for the obtrusive addition of mini-cinemas on the store's floor. The Odeon neon signs on the outside lasted in their original position until the summer of 1985, when they were taken down, apparently because they were no longer safe electrically. The Odeon name has now been put on the light box, along with the names of the films being shown. The Odeon Theatre Clock is still there, if not in working order. Welling's Odeon was the first to be designed for the circuit by George Coles. This rather undistinguished, narrow auditorium has been used for bingo since 1960. Originally, though, there was a line of lighting set in the centre of the ceiling going towards the proscenium arch, a device seen in many of Cole's later Odeons. Cole's also designed the Kenton Odeon, closed in 1961 and later demolished. It was at Isleworth that George Coles provided a strikingly modern exterior for the first time. This Odeon, on the outskirts of Hounslow, was also an early casualty of declining audiences. Even in 1985, the letters of the word Odeon remain attached to the side wall of the auditorium. An interesting afterlife being converted into a film studios for making shorts and commercials. At Wally in Birmingham came the Wally Cinema with this dominating exterior designed by T. Cecil Howitt. The building was as impressive by night as by day. The tower with its flat top supported by short circular columns became the most distinctive feature of the small group of cinemas that this architect designed for the circuit. The Wally Cinema was a project originated by other entrepreneurs and Oscar Deutsch became involved with the completion of the financial arrangements. The interior of the Wally was, unusually, a combined effort by two architectural practices. The well-known firm of Satchwell and Roberts worked with that of Harry Whedon then an architect best known for housing and factories, who was represented by a young graduate, J. Cecil Clavering. Soon renamed Odeon, the Wally Cinema was later to become a bowling alley before being demolished in the early 70s. The best surviving example of T. Cecil Howitt's Odeon work is here at Western Supermare. architect made competent assertive use of a large corner site. The curved canopy binds together the rectangular elements above. The huge area of green yellow colored faience are relieved by the arrangement of the individual tiles in pairs with thinner joints juxtaposing the two upright tiles with two laid horizontally. Windows also break up the mass of tiles along with the horizontal bands of green. Although the back of the building had been exposed by the removal of adjacent property and there is an inappropriate style of lettering on a sign at this end of the building. This is otherwise still a spectacular and gratifying example of a cinema skillfully asserting its presence by its architectural design.
there is reason to believe that Western Supermare Odium is still not completely owned by the rank organization, and that local directors remain and have influence over policy decisions. This may well be a reason why so little of the exterior of the theater has been changed. Originally, flower beds were provided here by the emperor. are the original ones with which the cinema opened in May 1935. And this is an original light fitting just inside. The auditorium has also survived for years without drastic change, although the area under the balcony now discreetly holds two mini cinemas. The organ is still in place and played occasionally in 1985. Clapton Sodian was also unmistakably the work of T. Cecil Howitt. It is shown here in all its splendor in January 1974. The auditorium was almost identical to that of Western Supermare in its basic design, though a little stark and less imaginative than the outside. Over the circle, at Clacton, was a round shallow dome with concealed lighting, whereas at Western Supermare there was a rectangular shaped recess across the ceiling. Clacton also had no organ and seated less than at Western Supermare. The Wreckers Ball visited the Clacton Theatre in 1984 and it was pounded to bits to be replaced by shops. The Bridgewater Odeon survives in 1985. Although the flat top has now gone from the tower, leaving the circular supports looking as bereft as tree stumps. T. Cecil Howitt provided a stadium style of auditorium here, which has since been split up for bingo and two small cinemas at the rear. It is operated independently. Guildford Odeon brings to us a batch of more ordinary buildings. Perched on a steeply sloping ground, it originally had the Odeon name across the top. Guildford would not tolerate one of Cecil Howitt's brash modern exteriors, it would not even allow neon to be used on the frontage. Architects Andrew Mather and J. Rayworth Hill came up with a dignified use of brick with panels of classical decoration that were considered in much better taste. The original entrance doors are still in use in 1985, 50 years after the Odeon opened. It looks little like the other Odeons and suggests that this may have been one of the many schemes designed before Oscar Deutsch took interest and little altered once it was taken under the circuit's wing. One has to ascend to reach even the stalls where there are now installed two more of the mini cinemas that proliferated throughout the circuit.
From the circle, the auditorium looks a little changed. It was Andrew Mather's practice that produced this rather startling and utterly uncharacteristic design for the outside of the Odeon Chingford, now demolished. The tower helped draw attention to its side street location. It's a severe anticlimax to pass into this plain and ugly auditorium. At Little Hampton, Mather came up with an altogether dreary Odeon with a pompous frontage of classical touches seen here in May 1936 when the cinema was about to open. With one of the nine purpose-built Odeons in Sussex, the others being at Lewis, Kemp Town, Brighton, Worthing, Port Slade, Horsham, Lansing and Bognor. All of them were good money takers for the circuit until war broke out. Little Hampton remained an Odeon until the famous sale to Classic in November 1967, which took the whole of the cinema trade by surprise. The mighty rank organisation disposing of properties to the small chain of former repertory cinemas called Classic. There's a parallel sided box like auditorium inside. Access to the circle was by a passage that led into the front of one side of the circle. Hardly an ideal arrangement for filling the area. The colour shots of this building date from September 1973, when it was operated by the chain of classic cinemas before going over to Bingo. Ashford's Odeon was another by Andrew Mather, recorded here in August 1973. In 1985, it is a bingo hall. It too lacks 30s flair but it was spacious and had a dramatic ceiling pattern closing in on the proscenium arch. At Faversham, Andrew Mather's efforts were directed towards blending in with the historical character of the town. It is seen here in colour shots from June 1981 when it was operated independently as the Royal, combining films and bingo. Films have now gone. It was a stadium type of hall, seating 729, decorated with crests on the side walls. Gate Odeon was the only one designed by theatre architect Bertie Crewe. It is seen here in August 1977, during its last five years as an independent called the Capitol, with seating, formerly in the National Film Theatre, occupying the stalls floor and the circle gutted. 
It has now been demolished. In an outlying part of Birmingham, the Shirley Odeon was designed by local architect Roland Satchwell of Satchwell and Roberts. It seated 1,156 on a stadium plan and, as the largest hall in the vicinity, was sometimes pressed into use for public meetings. It is seen here in July 1975. Roland Satchwell was also the architect of the Stafford Odeon, shown in 1936 and, in colour, in August 1974. alignment of the projectors indicates the unique feature of this Odeon, projection from the rear stalls more or less straight at the screen. for the boiler had to be dragged through the auditorium, depositing dust everywhere. But theatre was very oddly planned, perhaps due to site restrictions. It had only 956 seats, a very pinched proscenium arch, and front stores area unlike any other purpose-built Odeon. It is now the Astra Film Center, divided up into three cinemas. The last Odeon, designed by Yates, Cook and Derbyshire, was this one at Wimbledon, South London seating 1,501. It closed in 1960, and since then, the Wimbledon Gaumont has taken over the Odeon name. In August 1973, the Portsmouth Odeon is photographed embarking on a new era with three screens in its auditorium set well behind the imposing show front. The minis are tucked away out of sight of the view from the circle, but modernization has already removed virtually all the original decoration, as seen from December 1936, except for the distinctively shaped grills on the side walls. A modern cake stand now feeds the film into the projectors. After T. Cecil Howitt, the next real triumph of Odeon design was provided by J. Cecil Clavering of Harry Whedon's staff, who created, in the now listed Odeon King Standing, Birmingham, a thoroughly modern, simple and eye-catching building that skillfully juxtaposed areas of brick and faience, 
that had streamlining in its rounded corners and main entrance block, and that had an elegantly slim three-layer tower feature. This was the Odeon style at its purest and deftest, fortunately preserved for us even though the building has succumbed to bingo. The auditorium, with a small balcony, is less impressive, but likeable. The original photographs date from July 1935, the colour ones from exactly 40 years later. J. Cecil Clavering again demonstrated his brilliance at Sutton Coalfield, where he arranged the main entrance on a corner, a design repeated exactly, inside and out, at Harrogate, except for an additional 47 seats being provided there. This example of essential Odeon architecture has also been given listing protection by the Department of the Environment at Sutton Coalfield, although the top of the slab tower has been removed. Since these colour views of Harrogate were taken, the original light fittings shown in the entrance hall have been replaced. The auditoriums of both theatres have been adapted to provide mini cinemas under the balcony and both remain open in 1985. Less fortunate was J. Cecil Clavering's odium for Colwyn Bay, which was one of the earliest to close in January 1957. Once again, the shapes and contrasts in materials are admirably arranged on the outside, while the interior is far less striking and original, even if it provides excellent sight lines and comfortable viewing conditions. Years later, the building was reopened for films in the circle and bingo downstairs as the Astra Entertainment Centre. When J. Cecil Clavering left Wheaton to join the Government Office of Works, other architects in the office followed the lead, with new Odeons of considerable finesse. The Odeon Scarborough is similar to Sutton Coalfield in its external handling and has an uncharacteristically flamboyant use of a repetitive floral pattern on the side walls. The Odeon St. Orstall had a simple scheme of auditorium design and is seen here, like many of these other Odeons in original photographs, with the screen tabs showing. These were in brilliant colours. The Odeon Lancaster the slab tower thrusts upwards and twists against the run of the building. The Odeon Berry has a tall central box dressed in faience. Inside, more striking screen tabs in this 1936 photograph. The Odeon Loughborough 
his pure thirties and brimming with confidence. The light faience mass relieved by windows, sitting on a black base and terminating in curved corners. Inside, the screen curtains show an Odeon all on its own in the mountains. The Odeon Falmouth, seen with posters temporarily placed over the shop windows until the sights are let, was far too good an Odeon to be demolished for a supermarket. The Odeon Oldham is a reminder of occasions when the Harry Whedon practice modernised existing cinemas. Here, the outside was little changed, but the interior was completely reconstructed in the summer of 1936 to provide a modern environment in place of that which had existed in the building's days as a music hall. At Chester, the Whedon office had to build an Odeon frontage entirely in brick and also to create a more traditional style of lettering for the Odeon name in order to obtain planning permission. The solution was both dignified and modern. By the time these shots were taken in August 1974, the recesses in the ribbed ceiling were no longer lit up like the thin strips along the corner of each side wall which descend in a tear shape to the side of the proscenium arch. A dignified use of brick was also obligatory at York, even though the Odeon was well outside the historical part of the town. These views, from about August 1974, show the Odeon after the original circle had been extended forwards and the screen raised in height. Two smaller cinemas are underneath. Andrew Mather's architects began to shape up at the challenge posed by Harry Whedon's crew when a young recruit
Horace Ward, designed this superb Odeon exterior at Well Hall, London. This is the independent coronet. Another Mather job, the Ramsgate Odeon, also exhibited real flair. And here, the horizontal were ingeniously linked to the design of the main curtains. This is now a twin classic cinema. And now for a look at some of the Odeons designed by George Coles in the second half of 1936. At Southall, the exterior had a stolid dignity, and it was inside that one found more of the modern 30s flavour. became a short-lived bowling alley and then a showroom. At Ipswich, also to conform with planning requirements, the exterior had a restrained approach with tasteful classic touches. Note the foyer's false ceiling here in 1974 compared with the splendid original design. Note also the decorative light fittings on the side walls and their absence in 1974, creating a bland, dreary auditorium with only the vigorous downward sweep of the linear pattern in the centre of the ceiling still remaining to attract the eye. The cinema is now a bingo hall. At Muswell Hill, the Coles treatment was pure 30s art deco, inside and out. And this well-preserved surviving example of Odeon design at its best will be visited in detail later on. At Horsham, an advertising pylon draws attention to the cinema's entrance, set back from the road. Spacious foyer and circle lounge with superficially applied decoration on the upper walls and ceiling led to a compact, narrow auditorium with a simple but effective decor. This Odeon has been demolished.
trailers were introduced at Odeon's in the 1950s in the form of pages of an album. These were the first trailer titles to be issued on the then new non-inflammable film stock. This more elaborate style had been used. The first Odeon of 1937 was at Sittingbourne, an undistinguished theatre designed by F.C. Mitchell. Drury and Gomeshall designed the Odeon Warrington. This was these prolific regional architects' only contribution to the circuit and probably a takeover scheme. The Odeon is a triple in 1985. The Odeon Lowestoft, now demolished, was handled by Andrew Mather. He provided an unsubtle box-like exterior and an attractive auditorium, but one that was unexciting and uninspired. Hanley's opening souvenir programme contains shots of the old Grand Theatre destroyed by fire, which the new Odeon replaced. In 1975, after thorough interior modernization had robbed it of much interest. This was a Harry Whedon design. The Odeon closed in 1975, and the name has now been transferred to the town's Gaumont. Here at Reading, A.P. Starkey had his only opportunity to design one of the larger, later Odeons, and he delivered an exterior of considerable panache, with its Odeon sign mounted against a dark background to face the busy thoroughfare at the end of this side street. The interior was well handled. The lighting scheme had been considerably simplified by the time these shots were taken in 1973. This Odeon has been twinned since then with, unusually, the balcony being closed off to provide a second, smaller auditorium.
Wrexham, the Harry Whedon designed Odeon, was, by 1974, being used for bingo as well as films. A bingo scoreboard is concealed behind the curtains which interrupt the illuminated grill work on each side of the screen. Down lighting has replaced the original cove lighting across the ceiling. Bingo has since reigned supreme at Wrexham. At Hereford, a dull frontage and a long passage led to a dramatic auditorium treatment by architect Roland Satchwell, with a powerful use of concealed lighting. has been scarcely altered on the day that it closed in March 1984. A substantial preservation effort was not able to save the building from demolition. At Forest Gate in East London was to be found this rather indifferent Odeon designed by Andrew Mather. The typical Odeon ash stands seen here in the Circle Lounge lasted until the cinema's closure in 1975. Some Surrey, the Odeon needed this front elevation of narrow bricks and stone dressings to obtain planning permission from the council, but a small tower was permitted. Note the awkward vertical placement of the Odeon name. Architects Winnie, Sun and Austin Hall provided a simple, effective auditorium inside. The same architects also designed the fine Odeon at Harlesden. A more ample tower displays the Odeon name more pleasingly here, while the curve a corner recalls the similar feature at the Worthing Odeon. Beyond the spacious lay another clearly designed auditorium. The Odeon is unmistakably from the Harry Whedon office. Here, though, there was an experiment with holophane lighting. The ceiling is covered in concave discs which reflect changing colours and which descend behind the cut-back side walls. At Aylesbury, the Odeon is seen stripped of its exterior tiles. Another designed by Andrew Mather's team. It has been tripled since 1973 and the mini cinemas under the balcony jut out rather obtrusively, as at Barnet. George Coles was the architect of the fine Berries and Edmonds Odeon, which has fallen into a dilapidated state when these photographs were taken in August 1974.
Although begging for sensitive refurbishment and the restoration of the original lighting scheme in the auditorium, the Odeon was deemed good enough to be listed for its architectural merit, only to be delisted and demolished when its location impeded a redevelopment scheme. At Crewe, the Odeon should certainly have been listed. Its outstanding exterior with wafer slim tower and parade of shops obviously stems from the Harry Whedon team. The cinema had been superbly maintained and was leased out to an independent chain for several years before closing and being demolished. A sad loss. In the Croydon area at South Norwood, Andrew Mather's Odeon enlivened a trad area and was more impressive internally than these shots suggest. It lasted until 1971 before being demolished for a supermarket. Andrew Mather's work at the nearby Penn Podium was ponderous and ugly. A lumpish exterior, a cramped foyer, In 1974, when these colour views were taken, a dingy, cavernous auditorium that kept away all but the most determined cinema-goer. The checkerboard acoustic tiles hardly help. Lovely's Odeon was a delight drawn up by Harry Whedon, one of the classics of Odeon architecture, in which all the elements blended harmoniously and another Odeon that might have been lit. survives, superbly restored, not as a cinema, but as the assembly hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses. At Bournemouth, the Odeon's tower is central to a parade of flats. was called Harlequin seating resulted in an unusual distribution of seats in different colors. This George Coles design theater has been stripped of almost all its original decoration in the name of modernization. Although the colorful screen curtain survived backstage, creased up and unwanted, in 1973. This Odeon has become a Granada bingo hall. In Radcliffe near Bolton was to be found another accomplished Odeon from the Whedon practice that lasted only until 1957 and has since been converted into supermarket use.
Boston, in Lincolnshire, a 1977 visit revealed an Odeon altered only in name. It had become part of the classic circuit and has since become the independent Haven Cinema. The recess in the circle ceiling still bears the original decoration of 1937. Harry Whedon's work at Bolton resulted in a monumental Odeon seating two and a half thousand and boasting a rare cinema organ. are the exits to each side of the front of the circle. An odd position for an Odeon theatre, although popular with other circuits. At Burnley, the Whedon flair was evident in the Odeon exterior with its slim advertising tower and cream standing out from the mass of brick. Closed in 1973, this Odeon is but a memory. Also, no more than a memory, are the most striking details of the Exeter Odeon. Brat Canopy, Finely detailed circle lounge. Quaint auditorium figures high on the side walls were all wiped out in the name of progress. This Odeon continues, tripled in 1985, a shadow of its former self. At Morecambe, the Whedon exterior is an odd but compelling mixture of features. The auditorium is more efficient than inspired. Cloth its exterior tiles and looks uncomfortably bare.
these 1974 shots, the original light fittings can still be seen in the circle ceiling, but the ribs on the side walls were originally part of a more subtle decorative and lighting treatment. Swiss Cottage in North London has an Odeon based on a design by the well-known architect Robert Cromie and adapted by Harry Whedon for Odeon's purposes. Back in 1937, Warner Brothers pictures were widely played at Odeon's, but a few years later, they moved to the rival ABC circuit. Like Bolton, this was another large Odeon, seating over 2,000, that had a Compton organ. Regrettably, this powerful interior decorative scheme has been eliminated by modernization. Weedon at Wolverhampton resulted in another excitingly handled exterior. The auditorium was rather an anticlimax with parallel coves in the ceiling and side walls that were originally lit by concealed lighting. This exterior at Woolwich by George Coles an entrance and side wall clad in faience tiles and a splendid tower was the cause of this Odeon being listed as deserving of preservation. A bland auditorium is once again the result of modernization. Originally, there was a linear feature so characteristic of this architect on each side wall that added interest. This Odeon at Rill in North Wales has just the luxurious allure needed to tempt holidaymakers inside. It was another Harry Whedon scheme, and in recent years has been part of the Hutchinson's Astra circuit, like the former Stafford Odeon. In 1937, the Odeon circuit took stock of its progress as its most important theatre neared completion. With an uncharacteristic black frontage and a 120-foot high tower, the frontage remained unaltered in 1965 when Von Ryan's Express arrived on the Odeon's screen. But two years later, the changeable neon display was dropped in favor of a huge light box, which itself seems to have dropped from the bare recess left above it. Modernization has affected this entrance hall, staircase, and circle foyer. In the auditorium, the original concealed lighting in the troughs across the ceiling has been discontinued, and the walls in front of the circle were rendered plain. The Compton organ remains and is still used from time to time. With its original seating for 2,116 reduced to 1,983, this still huge Odeon continues in 1985 as the flagship of the circuit 
and the biggest cinema in the West End of London. The original safety curtain, with its vivid fresco of film action, can still be lowered. Alas, these figures no longer plunge forward from the side walls. They disappeared in the 1967 modernization. But to relieve the dullness of the bare wall, new decorative features had to be introduced. Currently, there is a wave-like design, which is lit up at intervals. Five more Odeons opened in the last two months of 1937. At Acton, George Coles came up with another stylish Odeon. The linear lighting features contributed to a vigorous horizontal thrust offset by the circular decorations on the side walls. George Coles also designed the huge Edgware Road Odeon, but this was to be opened by another smaller circuit until Odeon brought up the project just before it was completed. In fact, Odeon had to spend only £831 on further outfitting, which included the circuit's standard clocks. Understandably, the auditorium looks nothing like the normal Odeon style. The North Watford Odeon was also taken over. Designed by J. Owen Bond to be a Ritz for Lou Morris, it became a striking addition to the Odeon circuit with an ultra-modern treatment of the splay walls in the auditorium. This tall, narrow entrance at South Seas Odeon recalls that of the nearby Portsmouth Odeon, and it too was the work of Andrew Mather's practice. By 1973, his extensive entrance area was put to little practical use. Its large auditorium still seated over 1,500 people.
1977, this Odeon was taken over by an independent, renamed the Salon, and eventually closed in 1983. At Brighton, Andrew Mather originally designed a cinema for an independent, but the scheme was taken up by Odeon. The original exterior was severely modernised and the derelict building is seen here in the winter of 1985. It was closed in favour of the new Odeon Triple in the nearly adjacent King's West Centre. The first Odeon in Brighton was the former Palladium, a reminder that many cinemas on the circuit were taken over rather than purpose-built. The Odeon at Norwich was the first of 25 new Odeons opened in 1938. Another of the Harry Whedon-designed cinemas, its restrained facade contrasts with the exuberant handlings of the decorative grills in the auditorium. This Odeon seated 2,054, much larger than average, and was closed in 1971. It was sold in a deal that provided for a new Odeon elsewhere with half the seating, which opened two weeks after this was shut down. The Chorley Odeon was another designed by Whedon's team, and it had a slim tower with the Odeon name on the projecting pin. The auditorium seated a more average 1,526 on a stadium plan. As at Norwich, the side grills received conspicuous treatment. George Coles gave the Erith Odeon in Kent a massive frontage in faience, unrelieved by brick and with only one small line of windows. The auditorium seating only 1,246, was wonderfully streamlined, with bands on the sidewalls and ceiling pointing towards the screen. As a bingo hall in more recent years, its scheme of illumination has been replaced by direct downlighting. Another modest-sized Odeon opened at Spalding in Lincolnshire, designed by Harry Whedon. It was sold in 1967, later becoming the independent regent. It was designed on the stadium plan. Few Odeons show the Whedon flare better than the one at Newport in South Wales, photographed here in August 1975. Its skillful blend of brick and bayance, its slab tower and rounded corner all recall the treatment of Sutton Coldfield and Harrogate. The auditorium is restrained but welcoming.
This Odeon closed in 1981. Though expected to become a bingo hall, it was simply left standing and unused. In South East London, the Eltham Hill Odeon was another designed by Andrew Mather. It was only a short distance from the Well Hall Odeon, and in fact was later renamed Gaumont to help distinguish it from its near neighbour. was on stadium lines with the rear raised section built over the entrance hall. It survives as a bingo hall, but the auditorium has lost most of its interest. The Ballamodian in South London had arguably the finest of all the frontages designed by George Coles. Here, he once again used a mass of faience facing, uncontrasted with brick and with only a modest interruption by windows. The symmetrical design with its rounded corners and thin tower was wonderfully assured and inviting in its location at the top of Ballam Hill. Its entrance hall was excellent in leading the patron from foyer to auditorium, but some find the juxtaposition of angles and curves conflicting. The organisation of the auditorium decoration was also somewhat confused. The Ballamodium was overall one of the triumphs of the circuit's architecture. George Coles also designed the Brentwood Odeon, seen here in 1973. This was much simpler externally, but, like Ballam, confined the site of brick to the auditorium block behind. Retaining its island pay box in the spacious entrance hall, The long, narrow auditorium had a streamlined look with illuminated bands in the ceiling and along the side walls. The forward thrust of these features was cleverly terminated in a graceful curve and in a right angle bend on the side walls to end up on the Odeon clock. The Odeon was subject to a compulsory purchase order, which forced its closure in 1974. New cinemas in the redevelopment scheme were operated by another circuit. At Redhill in Surrey, there was a carriage drive to the front steps of the Odeon Theatre, opened in May 1938. was built on piles over a good-sized brook and the site is alongside the London to Brighton railway line. Since closing in 1975, it has become a disco called Busby's with a modified entrance.
There are many broken windows at the side and rear of the auditorium, and the brickwork is in a poor state and in need of repointing. The exterior and the pylon on Station Road look forlorn in the winter of 1985. We can step back in time to July 1973, when this was still the Odeon, with very few alterations to its appearance. Designed by Keith P. Roberts in Andrew Mather's office, this was an Odeon of considerable appeal. The original sound and projection equipment at Odeon was BTH. By 1951, many had changed to BTH Supra projectors, but there were complaints about the sound on these, and they, in turn, were replaced by Kaylee 21s. The tilted dado echoes the tilt in the circle seating, while the proscenium arch is reinforced by a succession of ribs around it. Hill was the nearest Odeon to J. Arthur Rank's home at Rygate, and Mrs. Rank was a frequent patron to the afternoon matinee performance. In 1973, the cinema had its concealed lighting and its Odeon clock, a small gem. The original pre-cinemascope screen frame at Redhill was fixed straight to the rear wall with the speaker chamber set in an alcove. Keith P. Roberts, who did the detailed drawing for this and many other Odeon theatres, reputedly trained in the drawing office that specialised in the interior for ocean liners. Many observers believe they can see evidence of this in Red Hill Odeon. Wow. An awkward sight, the Halifax Odeon bears few of the trademarks of its architect, Lord Cole, who was working far away from his normal patch. Most certainly designed for another circuit and hurriedly transferred to Odeon when the speculators realised that associated British cinemas were well advanced in their plans for a large regal in the town, the regal opened in September 1938 and the Odeon in November. Its auditorium seated over 2,000. Proscenium treatment is more like that favoured by T. Cecil Howitt in his Odeons. gracious figures of the spinners on the side walls recalling the textile industry of the town were smoothed out in another regrettable modernization scheme. Halifax Odeon was a huge theater and by the time these colour photographs were taken in August 1974, was well past its prime and had fallen on very hard times. Its chief projectionist had trained at the Ritz Seaford on the south coast and he was a fund of information on the day-to-day -day running of that theatre in its heyday. Another huge Odeon was the one at Peckham, which replaced an old theatre 
The columns fronting the central recess were removed over the years. This Mather Odeon has been entirely demolished. At Uxbury, the Odeon unusually had offices stuck on the front. It was another Odeon designed by Keith P. Roberts, working for Andrew Mather. Due to its close proximity to Pinewood Studios, many of the daily rushes were screened here when preview theatres at Pinewood were overbooked. Its rather dowdy interior in these 1975 shots was much improved by redecoration when the area under the balcony became two mini cinemas in 1976. It has since closed for a replacement scheme incorporating new cinemas which has suffered seemingly endless delays. Bristol, the striking corner exterior still remains, although the cinema entrance has been shifted to one side. The original entrance is now a shop. T. Cecil Howitt's vast auditorium has vanished, with three new cinemas being opened high up, and below, on two floors, the building has been redeveloped as retail premises for mother care and other stores. At the East Ham Odeon, Keith P. Roberts designed a frontage that greatly anticipates the 50s style. The cinema replaced a much older picture house and seated 2,212. The auditorium is well planned, but became dull as a result of another boring modernization scheme. was so wrong with the auditorium, as seen here when it opened in July 1938. Another big working class Odeon was at Hackney Road, where the Mather organisation provided a rather crude exterior This was the first Odeon to be turned over to full-time bingo in 1961 and it is still used for that purpose. It has been longer on bingo than it was on film and is now so thoroughly altered internally as to be unrecognisable. Harry Whedon's Odeon at Leicester survives as a triple in 1986. Venture inside and you'll find no trace of the original decorative treatment of the entrance hall or auditorium. As a key provincial cinema on the circuit, it was far too important to be left alone. In Leicester, the circuit had great difficulty in finding a site of sufficient size in the town centre. After three years, it was decided to sacrifice a central location in order to build a large Odeon a little way off from the commercial hub. This, of course, may have helped it to survive today. The first purpose-built Scottish Odeon was at Ayr. Now devoid of its exterior tiles, it survived in 1986 as a single-screen cinema with a modernised auditorium. Scotland has also shed its exterior tiles and has become a three-screen cinema. The third in Scotland was at Motherwell, which closed in 1975 and went on to become a bingo hall. All three of the Scottish Odeons were handled by Andrew Mather and there were plans for 12 more when Motherwell opened. None were built, seemingly because of the war.
Tory Odians seem particularly plain and uninteresting buildings, as if somehow they were under finance. They really do not seem to be worthy of the circuit. The fortress-like exterior of the Odeon at Deptford included a slim tower, with the Odeon name placed vertically on the narrow front, rather than across the wide protruding face at the top. Green vertical bands are visible in the colour shots of the derelict building waiting to be put out of its misery in 1979 when an estate agent's board offers the site for redevelopment. George Cole's designed cinema had one of this architect's less striking interiors, but one that still offered real luxury and comfort in a working class area. At Luton, the Odeon came from the Andrew Mather stable. Screen curtains were of the same design as those at Brighton. adopted an unusual treatment for the ceiling. The outer ring of light fittings recalls the way many of the Gaumont palaces were handled, rather than normal Odeon treatment. Working for Mather, Keith P. Roberts also handled the huge Mile End Road Odeon. This was extensively modernised in 1968, turned into a sundown disco and pop concert venue briefly in 1972, and subsequently used as an Indian cinema called The Liberty. We hope that these images of the building being demolished in May 1984 will not upset viewers too much. George Cold was in top form at the Shannon Corner Odeon with its wafer-thin tower carrying the Odeon name. The long line of lighting in the ceiling marks this as a George Cole's interior. Closed in 1960, converted to offices and now gone, this was sometimes referred to as the New Malden or Merton Odeon. In 1939 at Middlesbrough, Harry Whedon's team provided a black tower to contrast with the traditionally light tile treatment of the rest of the extensive frontage. At Camberwell, we see one of the two matching entrances to a colossal Odeon at the rear of a triangular site. The screen was positioned at the apex a central staircase led to the circle, which alone seated 986, more than many other cinemas altogether. Here, Keith P. Roberts created one of the simplest, yet most effective, of all Odeon interiors. Its lines were designed to lean towards the proscenium arch, and the ventilation ducts were openly exposed in a honeycomb-like pattern of holes. Total seating here was 2,470, which made it the largest Odeon in the London area, and there was excellent viewing from every seat. When these colour photographs were taken in October 1973, only the circle was in use. 
The stalls were not open to the public and the doors were locked shut. House lights in the rear stalls were not illuminated. Dalston Odeon was another from Andrew Mather's organisation, and these photographs date from a 1960s refurbishment. A very attractive building turned into a triple cinema in the 1970s, it was reputedly closed because of unruly audiences from its working-class catchment area. Certainly, it was the only theatre where the bandit screens over the kiosk had to be left in place, even when the cinema was open, because of pilferage. There was a monolithic exterior to the Blackpool Odeon, which was the largest of all, seating over 3,000 people. It opened in May 1939 without an organ, but a Compton was on its way to be installed sometime later. It was destroyed in transit by German bombing. Now tripled, this Odeon has fallen under threat of conversion to bingo in the early 1980s. Odeon at Elmer's End seemed a throwback to the Odeon's Oscar Deutsch was building in remote spots in the early days of the circuit, but it was attractively designed by Keith P. Roberts. Closed in 1957, it had not been a commercial success. It was only open for 18 years. Hendon, a rare incursion into the London area, was made by Harry Whedon to design the Odeon, and rather surprisingly, its exterior was entirely, and somewhat somberly, in brick. In 1974, this was one of the least altered of Odeons, and its interior was a delight. A foyer with its original light fittings, a sunny circle lounge, and an auditorium, which still has its pendant light fittings and concealed illumination in the recesses in the side walls with their curious black slanting columns. This was the last Odeon to open before the outbreak of war. Hostilities were so likely that Oscar Deutsch originally wanted to cancel or postpone the opening, but it took place on August the 28th, 1939. Normally, opening nights were packed to capacity, but the worsening international situation meant that only 200 people turned up, and not all of them lingered for the elaborate buffet set up in the circle foyer after the show. Other Odeons under construction had to be left uncompleted, and some of the existing theatres were closed, at least temporarily, by war damage. Here is the Bradford Odeon, a huge 2,713-seater opened in December 1938, seen here in 1940, when it had, ironically, been showing the Grapes of Wrath. The only purpose-built Odeon to be knocked out for good was at Canning Town, opened in May 1939 and closed less than two years later after bombs made it structurally unsafe. It was another Mather Odeon designed by Keith P. Roberts. Almost finished at the outbreak of war, the Worcester Odeon finally opened on the 2nd of January 1950. It was one of the Whedon Odeon and remains open in the 80s as a triple. Like Bradford, Elmer's End and Hendon, trough lighting had lost favour on account of its labour-intensive maintenance cost and chandeliers were back again. Like the Worcester Theatre, the Odeon Westbourne Grove, London, has little of the streamlined flair of the 30s buildings. It was a modification of a pre-war Andrew Mather design by Leonard Allen. It is seen here in 1983, after the back stores area had become two mini cinemas. The Highgate Odeon was the last of three pre-war schemes eventually completed. T.P. Bennett and Son were the architects. The Odeon opened in 1955 and closed in 1973 to be demolished the following year. New Odeons opened but many more closed as audiences diminished, including the Elmer's End Theatre, 
one of a batch discarded in late 1956 and early 1957. It was demolished, but others took longer to go away. Lewis Odeon was to have been disposed of classic in a famous sale of 1967, but it was already under offer from the then expanding Miles Byrne organization. The asking price was £35,000. When Miles Byrne turned it down, Roy Markwick of Uckfield Picture House became interested. Once again, negotiations came to nothing. Here is the derelict Odeon at Lewis, designed by Andrew Mather, opened in 1934, and closed in October 1971, and photographed here in 1933 and then in 1978. It was finally demolished in 1982. You can almost hear the echo of the thousands of patrons who walk down this long arcade. Perhaps they stopped off in this small restaurant area for a cup of tea, a cake, or egg on toast. Still faintly visible are the letters of the word Odeon, in a style at variance with the better known one. Oscar Deutsch was against having a cafe in the theatre. It was only at the insistence of local director E. O. Culverwell that it was incorporated in the plans. This large entrance hall stood at the end of the arcade and its last pay box can be seen. The auditorium stands empty and unloved. It was in the stadium style, seating 518 in the front part and 468 in the raised rear section. Lewis was the first Odeon to be built from scratch by Andrew Mather and is very similar to his adaptation of an existing structure at Kemptown, Brighton. At Lewis, his budget was twice that of Kemptown and he came up with a very lavish, spacious and fully equipped Odeon that had excellent sight lines and splendid acoustic. This is what the auditorium looked like at its best back in 1934. The Odeon in Llanelli in Wales opened in June 1938. It was designed for the Odeon circuit by Harry Wheaton, and as one of the weaker theatres, sold to Classic in November 1967. Classic tripled the cinema in October 1971, and in 1976 it was acquired by the Borough Council and remodelled to become a civic theatre. The Odeon Sheffield was one of the shortest lived purpose-built Odeons. Plans were first lodged with the City Council in 1933, but it was not until 1938 that Harry Whedon's office presented detailed drawings. The Odeon, as shown, was to be very similar to other Odeon cinemas with a vertical thin feature and a green and cream faience tile. Construction started in early 1939, but in September, when war was declared, all work on cinema buildings ceased. Restrictions on cinema construction were not fully removed until 1954. And by this time, as new city centre plans affected the original Odeon site, the design of the building had to be changed. Robert Bullivant who had been connected with many Harry Wheaton schemes, produced new plans, and the cinema was constructed by Sir Robert McAlpine, builder of the Odeon flagship in London's Leicester Square back in 1937. The Sheffield Odeon opened in July 1956. It had 1,524 seats downstairs and 816 in the circle. Total seating of 2,340 made it the largest cinema to open after the war. The Odeon lasted only 15 years. On Saturday, June 5th, 1971, it closed. Next day, it reopened as a top rank bingo club.
The Odeon Scarborough stands at a busy crossroads right opposite the main railway station. It was one of the best Odeon corner site composites, with a series of vertical and horizontal planes converging on a tall vertical fin. This used to carry the legend Cinema at the top, and the entrance was on the corner itself. The original Odeon sign was declared unsafe on account of the high winds and was removed from the front of the building. This Odeon, somewhat unusually, has bands of red, not green, tiling set in the black base of the fans. The Odeon is one of the finest surviving Odeon-built properties. The exterior is particularly impressive in cream faience and red brick with a distinctive fin. Above the canopy, over the corner entrance, are the more usual bands of green band. In October 1976, Mecca received permission to go over to Bingo at the capital Scarborough, and a rank spokesman said at the time, if the capital does drop films, consideration will be given to twinning or tripling the Odeon. At Scarborough, at least, the achievement of Odeon is officially recognised. The cinema had been designed by J. Cecil Clavering and Robert Bullivant for Harry Whedon's office. It opened on the 28th of March 1936 with The Goat Go West, starring Robert Donan. Locally born Charles Lawton performed the opening ceremony. The Odeon was a circle-only operation in 1986, but the stalls were kept scrupulously clean and could have been reopened any time business warranted it. The pay box was combined with the confectionery kiosk, but otherwise the entrance lobby and the foyer had not been altered. Upstairs, the Circle Lounge has the original design of settee for the use of waiting patrons. Doors from this foyer led to the cafe, once a popular rendezvous. The Scarborough Odeon was one of relatively few Odeons to boast a cafe restaurant. The interior may be rather over-decorated by modern Odeon standards and not in the choices of colours, but survived modernisation. In fact, in 1986, Scarborough and Air in Scotland were the only two original built Odeons that still remained a single auditorium. In May 1937, Oscar Deutsch recorded this coronation message. Within the next few minutes, we shall hear the voice of our beloved king, sending a message to his peoples throughout his empire. We, I know, who are sitting in this cinema tonight, have at heart not only the happiness of our king and queen, but also the future welfare and prosperity of that glorious empire to which he speaks tonight. Prayers this morning were offered by every creed, denomination and religion for that peace and prosperity 
and that our King and his beloved Queen may long reign over us. To all of us, this will probably be the most historic event of our lives. And those of us who have reached an age of responsibility will realize that the happiness and peace of this reign rest not only in the hands of our king as the captain of the ship of state, but in the loyal cooperation of all and every one of us who form the crew. To the children, I have sent a copy of the souvenir program with the hope that they may keep this and think back upon this historic day. To you all, I should like to offer my sincerest wishes for peace, health, wealth and success in whatever you may be doing and wherever you may be. And in conclusion, I know that my final words will find an echo in your heart when I say, God save the King. Preparation work to triple this theatre began. A Philips cake stand and Cinema Carnia projector were installed in the projection suite, but nothing more was done. Some very early circuit-style carpet can still be seen. In later theatres, the colour was changed to green. The final colour chosen for this Odeon design carpet was gold. The Odeon was the only surviving full-time cinema in Scarborough, Yorkshire's major seaside resort, and had a seating capacity of 1,711. But it too closed on October the 21st, 1988. This was a great pity, as it had remained almost unaltered and had been given grade two listing by English Heritage in December 1987. By this time, it was the last of the single screen Odeons, with the exception of Leicester Square. Apparently, the cinema had been losing money for the past four years and Rank felt that it was time to call it a day. The town is now left with no film entertainment for seven months of the year. The Opera House used to show films in winter, but hasn't done so since it had a change of use. However, there have been occasional screenings at the Hollywood Plaza and the Futurist Theatre. In December 1989, Alan Akebourne, the Scarborough-born playwright, who always premieres his plays locally, became interested in acquiring the Odeon and converting it into a live theatre. So, perhaps it will not be totally lost. The Odeon Bromley is one of the few surviving purpose-built Odeons in the London area, still open as an Odeon cinema. The exterior has been changed by the removal of the top section of the original facade, and the foyer has been thoroughly modernised and refurbished, but it is still quite obviously the same building. The interior, however, bears no resemblance to how it looked when it opened in September 1936. George Coles designed the cinema, and 40 years later, in 1976, the auditorium was subdivided into three screens. The area beneath the former circle that used to be the rear stalls was converted into two cinemas. The larger of these was screen two. Both cinemas had screen curtains and variable masking. Screen 2 seated 125. Screen 3 was a smaller version with 116 seats. This has recently been further reduced.
Upstairs, screen one, the original circle was enlarged, which was rather unusual at the time. This was done by extending the steppings over the former front stalls area to make a cinema that would hold 760 patrons. In February 1989, the Odeon was altered yet again. In accordance with current company policy, a fourth screen was added. This time, the circle was reduced to more or less its 1936 size, and a new screen was built over an extended section in advance of the original front row. This was done to enable a fourth cinema to be constructed downstairs in the former extended circle area, originally the front stalls. The 1976 stepping was retained, a new projection box built and a false ceiling constructed, reducing the height of the original proscenium arm, which was still used. Only a little of the original splay wall treatment of the 1936 building can still be seen. The new cinema seats about 300. Fortunately, fine Odeon still survived, like that at Muswell Hill, North London, designed by George Coles. Its merit has been recognised by official listing as a building of outstanding architectural interest. It is not seen to its best from the car park, however. Across the road lies the parish church of St. James. This church opposed the construction of the Odeon and was responsible for its entrance being positioned at the far end of the parade of shops rather than on the corner facing the church. Although the scheme had already been approved by the local planning authority, the church formed a sufficiently powerful lobby to have the license refused by the Middlesex County Council. The lack of windows above the canopy is a pointer to Cole's hand in the design. Behind a modest entrance lies an unexpectedly tall entrance hall. Here, an original light fitting hangs above the place where an island pay box was once located. The staircase is a major delight, perhaps somewhat Germanic in atmosphere. In spite of some changes, the Art Deco foyer, circled stairs and lobbies are still intact. They display the highest flair and imagination in their design. One of two matching entrances to the circle has been blocked by the new combined cash desk and confectionery counter, but otherwise this area remains little altered.
One of two matching light fittings is in a small rotunda leading to the stall's foyer. Besides being a triple screen cinema, the Odeon now houses a permanent exhibition of projectors and other film equipment. The other matching light fitting is in a similar rotunda above. This leads from the top of the staircase to the circle lounge. This Odeon is one of the most perfectly preserved original Odeon buildings. Besides the original light fittings already shown, there are several more. When one considers the number of times these fittings must have been cleaned and had their lamp replaced over the years, it is all the more remarkable that they still remain. In keeping with all aliens, the auditorium is comfortably furnished and planned with excellent sight lines. It has forms and devices which are both functional and symbolic of film processes. These express a machine aesthetic and represent the activities and purpose of the building. There is a long, segmented ceiling light running the full length of the ceiling from front to back, which might be interpreted as a strip of film. The step forms above the screen could be interpreted as camera shutters. Patterns in the plasterwork along the side walls are like film reels and spools. Decorations in the splay walls on either side of the proscenium contribute to the acoustic balance disguise the vents of the plenum heating system, conceal the lighting and give directional emphasis.
In a kind of way, the Odeon was ahead of its time, as there were really four cinemas. The fourth Odeon was for children on a Saturday morning. This was situated in the former front stall. Quite a few rows of seats had been retained, and entrance was through what had must have originally been a pay box for front stall patrons. The pay box is still there. The Odeon opened on September the 9th, 1936. It seated 1,827. 1,217 in the stalls and 610 in the circle. It became a triple screen operation on May the 26th, 1975. Could there be a more pleasing environment to settle back and enjoy a film? When the Odeon Leicester Square opened on Monday, November the 2nd, 1937, it struck a most modern note in London's West End. It still does today. Fence, which had been a feature of many provincial Odeons, was abandoned in favour of black marble, which covered the whole of the Leicester Square frontage. It was also used on the tower, which rises 120 feet above the pavement, and whether viewed from Leicester Square itself, or seen from a point just off Piccadilly Circus, is very impressive. The whole of this expanse of shining black marble still presents a very striking effect. Some 200 slabs, each 6 feet by 5 feet and 2 inches in thickness, The main entrance foyer has been refurbished several times. It was originally panelled in Australian maple and myrtle woods. There was no sales counter and the doors to the stalls were centrally positioned. Original carpet was wine coloured and had a blue border. Every detail of the main staircase from stalls to circle foyer has been replaced, including carpet, handrails, wall coverings and mirrors. Only the original steppings have been retained. Gone are the wall motifs depicting north and south and east and west, also the splendid 1930s style pendant light fitting. The circle foyer has also been completely changed. Doors that used to be at the head of the stairs have been removed. Originally the ceiling had lighting codes on either side. Facing Leicester Square, the circle foyer used to have a tea lounge but there was never a full restaurant at this area. A lady's boudoir led off the balcony foyer. 
The dressing tables were made of metal topped by black glass. Below the entrance foyer is the royal reception room. On the walls are medallions commemorating the construction of the This room used to be furnished with reproduction period furniture, but, like other areas of the theatre, has been remodelled and refurbished. Not surprisingly, the Odeon was at first equipped with BTH projectors and sound equipment. In 1983, a cake plan was introduced for the projection of 70 mil print, while a tower system is usually used for ordinary 35 mil programs. Cinema Carnia projectors were first installed in 1962 and are periodically upgraded to the latest model. The Odeon is always in the forefront of technological advances. It had large screen television in 1952 and in 1978 was the first British cinema to use an optical Dolby stereo sound system. It was in 1967 that the Odeon underwent the modernisation that made the first dramatic changes to its appearance. Seating capacity was reduced to 1,994, but the £200,000 alterations quickly became a source of embarrassment for the rank organisation. Especially regretted was the destruction of the figures by Raymond Britton Riviere on the side walls, which made the place seem intolerably plain and undistinguished. In the recent 1987 refurbishment, flow neon decorations have considerably improved its somewhat austere appearance. For the balcony, Special seating was originally designed in which the frame and standard were covered with the same material as that used for the upholstery. This was a striking leopard skin material. In 1990, the circle seating is still unique to the Leicester Square Odeon. The auditorium has only one balcony, and this is of an unusually flat break. Simplicity was the keynote successfully struck here, the walls and ceiling being finished in dull gold.
The painting on the safety curtain tries to interpret the entertainment provided at the theatre. A seated audience and green uniformed page boys express the music, dancing and films that were to be incorporated into the audience programmes. Bands of musicians are linked by festooned film to dancers and buses, trains and cars speeding towards the word Odeon emphasise the central venue of the theatre. This magnificent example of 1930s expressionism has escaped any kind of modernisation. In the 60s, when little effort was made to conserve features from buildings of the 30s, it narrowly escaped being painted over. It is seen now in its completely original state. It has never been cut. Above the sculptured figures by Raymond Breton Riviere, a semicircle of cove lighting started off the progressive house lighting of the auditorium. Lighting coves in the ceiling and walls were illuminated in sequence, gradually flooding the theatre with light from front to rear. A reversal of the sequence took the auditorium from light to dark. The auditorium was illuminated entirely by indirect lighting. Plans were also well advanced to bring back the sequential cove lighting in the remaining ribbed arches across the ceiling, but the horrific costs involved have meant that this plan has had to be shelved. Extending round the back of the stall's floor and along the side walls was attractive dark brown wood panelling. Right down in the bowels of the building, below the stage, is a most comprehensive air conditioning plant, ensuring that each of the nearly 2,000 patrons is given 1,200 cubic feet of fresh air every hour. Heating equipment consists of a series of gas-fired boilers, which also supply hot water for the building. Ingenious automatic controls on the heating system ensure a comfortable and uniform temperature throughout the theatre. Still fully functional is the orchestra lift, which has a total floor area of 480 square feet and is capable of bearing a load of 10 tonnes. This is the equivalent of 150 performers. In the centre of the orchestral pit, there is an electrically operated section which slides open. Beneath this, the organ console comes into view, on a lift. The console can be raised to either orchestral or even stage level.
The Compton's illuminated console has been specially designed for the theatre. It complemented the fibrous plaster of the auditorium and also the Riviera motives that prior to 1967 were on the side walls. The organ chambers are situated below the stage. The Compton organ in the Odeon made history by being the first instrument in any British theatre to have five keyboards. And the 17 pipe ranks and percussions were supplemented by an improved type of the Compton electron unit known as the Melotone. The organ contains some unusual stops which bring about a more traditional church tone. So much so that it has been described as more of a concert organ and as such one of the finest in the world. There have in the past been many schemes to subdivide the auditorium, but there are no longer any today. Instead, five small additional auditoria are now added to the side over the passage that used to exist between Leicester Square and Charing Cross Road. These opened in April 1990. So we come to the end of this in-depth excursion into the Odeon story. Had not the war broken out in 1939, and had Oscar Deutsch lived on, there would probably have been further Odeon buildings up and down the land. Certainly many more were planned, but by the time building regulations were eased long after the war had finished, the cinema bubble had burst. Instead of an increase in audiences, the slow decline had begun. The Odeon Leicester Square was built as, and continues to be, the flagship theatre of the circuit. Now refurbished and enlarged by the addition of small auditoria, the theatre is ready to cross into the 21st century, confident of retaining its position as the pre-eminent cinema of the United Kingdom.